When I was about 50, I started having high blood pressure and having high sugar readings in my blood. Chances are you or someone you know has type 2 diabetes. Millions of Americans are at high risk for developing this disease. Coming up today on All Things Heart, we'll explain who's at risk and the changes you can make right now to lower your odds of developing it. From the University of Kansas Health System. I am amazed. The team here is great. I came on a Tuesday and then by Saturday I had a heart in me. I have never seen a group of people work together so good as this team of heart specialists. I mean, it's just unreal. Stand by to set up show. And the Dolph C. Simons Jr. Family Two. Broadcast Studio. Roll. Always makes you feel like you're the most important patient on the planet. I felt heard and that was yeah. really big. This is All Things Heart. Good morning. It's Thursday, March 9th. I'm Alexis Del Cid. We have a fantastic program for you today. Welcome back to All Things Heart. Here is what we're talking about today. For 37 million people, diabetes is a real struggle. Are you one of them? The higher your blood sugar, the higher your risk of heart trouble. We're going to tell you the steps you can take right now to protect your heart. The patient you're about to meet has an incredible team of healthcare providers all working together to keep him healthy. But you might be wondering, what are our healthcare providers like outside the health system when they're not saving lives? We take you behind the mask for a look at what our doctors are like in their personal lives. It's fascinating. And of course, your questions and your comments are the heartbeat of every episode, so please send them in. You can reach us and our doctors on YouTube, Facebook, and at the All Things Heart email. You'll find all the links right there on your screen. For more than 37 million Americans, diabetes is a reality. The CDC estimates around 90 to 95 percent of people with diabetes have type 2 diabetes, and it most often develops in people over the age of 45. However, more children, teens, and young adults are developing type 2 diabetes. We will tell you the symptoms that can be tough to spot, making it even more important to get regular checkups, and how it affects your heart. That's how our patient Rob Munt first discovered something was wrong at a regular checkup. Christina Medina shows us. You don't want a sharp end. Rob Munt enjoys creating. His love? Then you take it back to the puzzle and... Stained glass. Make it fit. It's very nice. I, I love doing it. Now retired, he has more time to focus on his artwork and his health. When I was about 50, started having high blood pressure and started having high sugar readings in my blood when I went for my physical and uh, they said I should probably get checked out. Rob learned he was living with type 2 diabetes. For nearly 20 years, he did his best to manage the disease and effects on his body until an ER visit revealed the diabetes was hurting his heart, causing an irregular heartbeat and heart flutter. Diabetes is a disease that can cause you problems with your blood vessels and also your nerves. If you think about your heart, the nerves are what causes it to beat. The heart itself is a muscle and uh, the vessels that go to it uh, can become filled with plaque. Rob credits his doctors for not only helping him get better, but also for explaining in simple terms how his diabetes affects his body. He especially loves how the medical staff in different clinics all work together on his health needs. And having that uh, team uh, communicate with each other to keep you safe is worth it's weight and gold. Focused on his health, he's working to make the lifestyle changes he can. I've lost 30 pounds, and I'm using half the insulin I used when I went into the hospital. Mark it on the glass. I cut it with a cutting tool. Round cuts are very difficult. His goal is to be as healthy as possible for his family. His advice? Pay attention to yourself. Um, if you're not feeling right, you know, when I'd have an a irregular heartbeat, you can feel it. I felt it, but I just didn't know what it was. 
We are so pleased to have Rob joining us today. Your stained glass is beautiful. Along with endocrinologist Dr. Kristen Gerdy Novats. Dr. Gerdy Novats is the director of the Cray Diabetes Self Management Center. And we are also pleased to have cardiologist Dr. Pradeep Maman with us. First, Rob, I want to get right to you. How are you feeling today? I feel great today. I, and do you uh, feel like you're. COVID. So I was down for about two weeks, but uh, the, the great doctors at uh, KU uh, gave me the, some medicine. I, I feel pretty good today. Oh, that's so good to hear. So I'm glad you're past COVID. And do you feel like your, your diabetes is under control? You said you're down to half the medicine you started taking. Yeah, my blood sugar this morning was 107. Uh, so I'm doing really good on my diabetes and uh, also very good on my weight loss. I was down to, I'm 252 this morning, fully dressed. I was mm -hmm. weighed 288 uh, when I went into the hospital uh, a year and a half ago. Oh, wow. Well, congratulations. That's all great news to hear. I wanna bring in Dr. Gerdy Novats to be clear now, you don't treat Rob, but is what he's describing the typical treatment for type two diabetes, exercise and medication? Yeah, absolutely. The first thing that we recommend for any patient with type two diabetes is lifestyle interventions. Easier said than done, but eating healthier, um, moderate carbohydrate intake, moving your body more, and then we can add on some other medications if lifestyle interventions aren't enough. Usually we pick metformin as our first line agent, and then after that it's really the patient-centered approach to care. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different medications available, so we take into account the patient's comorbidities and preferences to pick a regimen that works best for the individual. And Rob, are you on the medication that Dr. Gertie Novats just mentioned, metformin? No, I was at one time. I'm on insulin injectable okay. now. We have a graph that shows your A1C, um, and I want to put that up. But first of all, I have to ask, what's, what's an A1C? So an A1C is how we measure your blood sugar in your body and, and ultimately your diabetes control. It can also be used to help us diagnose diabetes. Everybody has sugar in their blood, and so an A1C measures how much sugar is stuck to your red blood cells. So what are we looking at here for Rob? So that is a trend of A1Cs, and you can see that his A1C over time has definitely improved and is at a goal. I typically recommend less than 7% for patients with diabetes. And he had two, the top two ones were red and had exclamation marks. That means he's achieving that goal. Correct. Now, what's this we're looking at? Um, I think that's a different graph, just showing that how his A1C has trended down over time with okay. the addition of weight loss, lifestyle intervention, and medication. Dr. Maman, I want to weave you in now as a cardiologist. What is it about type 2 diabetes that raises the risk for heart attack and stroke? Well, that, that's a little complicated issue in terms of the interplay between diabetes and heart disease. Um, it's uh, several fold. Um, I view high sugars causing the heart cells, um, the energy factor in these heart cells, to be dysfunctional, and so that affects overall cardiac function. Um, it also has an interplay with the, the blood vessels. Um, that, along with high cholesterol, results in plaque buildup within the arteries of the heart, which over time can rupture and cause a heart attack. Um, and so there are multiple ways how diabetes affects the heart, but those are just two of the ways. We have a couple images that I would love for you to explain okay. to our viewers. There are Rob's echo uh -huh. and stress tests. So as we put those up, can you explain what we're seeing here? Because for people who are not in medicine, this looks like hieroglyphics. Yeah, so this looks like it's a stress test, a okay. nuclear stress test, um, both at rest and, and at, um, at baseline and at rest. Um, does not look like there's uh, much difference with stress in okay. terms of flow. So this looks like it's a, n a normal stress test um, from, what, from the way I see it here. Now, this is the echo? Uh, oh, yeah, this okay. is a still image of an echo. Um, and it looks like there's contrast in there looking at the left and right ventricle. The left uh, is on our right. Mm -hmm. um, and overall, this is a still image, so I 
can't really say the overall function, but okay. the size of the heart looks appropriate. Now, when we talk about um, the statistics of just the sheer number of people who have diabetes. There's also that statistic that more and more children are developing diabetes, and I would love both of your input on this. Um, I wanna give you some numbers. 37 million Americans have diabetes. What can people with diabetes currently do to lower the odds of damage to their heart? Who wants to start first on this one? Dr. I Bowman? mean, I think the first and foremost is uh, keep moving, exercise, okay. right? Um, and exercise can be cumulative, so it do, you don't have to do it all at once. Um, wa walking, doing steps, just keeping on moving and then watching what you eat. So I think part of the reason why younger people, are, we're seeing more diabetes in younger people is uh, obesity. People are not moving, people are eating kind of unhealthy foods and gaining weight. And all of that contributes to the development of diabetes from a heart standpoint. I'm so, so. glad that you brought that out about younger people because Dr. Gerdinovitz, more and more children are developing diabetes and I would love to get your take on this study from the CDC and the National Institutes of Health. From 2002 to 2017, the rate of new cases of type one diabetes in young people went up by about 1.8% every year. During that same time period, the rate of new cases of type 2 diabetes went up even more dramatically, 4.8% every year. Do you have a theory on why we're seeing those numbers increase and why so much more for type 2? I think it's the same thing that, that was just mentioned. I think yeah. that as a society, we're choosing the wrong types of foods, eating too much of them and, and not moving our bodies enough. And so um, obesity, patients that are overweight is becoming more and more prevalent. There's also a lot of risk factors that can contribute to the development of diabetes, like high blood pressure and high cholesterol. So all of these things together um, kind of make sense why this is being diagnosed earlier and earlier. In addition to that, we're starting to screen uh, much earlier, the American Diabetes Association just recommended to start screening for type 2 diabetes at the age of 35. And that was my next question is, is it possible the numbers aren't climbing and we're just getting better at diagnosing it or are you pretty sure it's more people have it? I think more people are getting diabetes. I think that um, by the year 2020 I read a statistic that one in three people will have type 2 diabetes and so it is just our lifestyle and not being able to um, really do the, the interventions that we need to, to stay healthy. Wow. So, you know, that's interesting because I do remember <laughs> when I was little, if it was, if the weather was not, it would, not dangerous, you would just leave the house on a Saturday and you're not home until you're, it was dinner time. Now I know exactly where my son and his friends are because it's the Xbox. <laughs> and now that he can drive, it's changed a little bit, but they're just not, kids aren't just going out and running around and sweating, you know, they're, they're at home. Um, from a cardiology standpoint, Dr. Maman, are you seeing more people come to you with heart problems because of their diabetes? Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's a constellation of things, but um, yes, younger patients are coming in to see their cardiologists and having more cardiovascular issues, whether it's hypertension, heart attacks, or heart failure. Um, all of that is uh, occurring at a younger and younger age. Yes. Do you find, um, when it comes to tag teaming, cardiology and um, endocrinology, would you get a patient first and then refer them to a cardiologist or would you get the patient first and then refer them to an endocrinologist? What comes first? <laughs> Oh, I typically. Think, I think I we think, work hand in hand. Yeah. I mean, I think it goes both ways. I mean, we see several patients who come the first time they've entered the healthcare system and they come with a, a massive heart attack and we find out that they have di new onset diabetes. And they didn't and know reach, they had it. And they didn't know that and we reach out wow. to endocrinology to assist us and I'm sure it goes both ways. We have a QR code up on your screen right now. It has valuable information attached to it. You can scan that code. You will find out more information on the symptoms and the risks of diabetes and all your treatment options and we have plenty of questions coming in from our viewers. I want to start with Carrie. Carrie has a good question. Carrie wants to know how do you test for diabetes? Is this done automatically at my yearly physical? Dr. Gordon Novats? Uh, typically, we recommend screening yearly for diabetes. It's a simple blood test with the A1C um, measuring how much 
sugar is stuck to your red blood cell. So an A1C of 6.5% or higher is consistent with diabetes. Is this something that would happen at like my teenager's physical or does this start when I'm as I get older, I need to request it. It typically starts at the age of 30 now, okay. or 30, 35 now, according to those guidelines. But if there is a high level of suspicion, if patients have those additional risk factors, physicians can certainly screen patients earlier. Joe wants to know, and this would be a question for Dr. Maman, how do you diagnose heart disease with diabetes? What would be the symptoms to look out for? So, um, so the classical symptoms of heart disease, of having angina or chest pain when you when you walk or do something physical, um, is not is sometimes masked by diabetes, um, and sometimes just shortness of breath. Um, when you're doing something physical, may be a sign that there may be something wrong with your heart. So. Marie has a question. She wants to know if type two is hereditary. Type 2 diabetes can definitely run in families. There's um, kind of a hereditary component as well as an environmental component. Right. So if, if I have a friend who developed diabetes when she was in her 40s, does that mean her children are at greater odds? They certainly it? can be at, at risk for developing uh, diabetes, but again, it's a huge lifestyle component that will really affect if that happens. I want to get to a question from Kara. I know this is a tough one we talked about to answer, but Kara writes, and I swear my grandma told me this when I was little too. When I was little, my mom told me if I ate too many sweets, I'd give myself diabetes. Is that true? And I remember my grandma, I ate a whole package of cinnamon rolls when I was a kid. Gross, right? But they went down so easy. Um, she told me, you're gonna give yourself diabetes. Can you give yourself diabetes? You know, diabetes, type two diabetes is insulin resistance. So we typically, again, sugar isn't bad, but we just typically eat far too much of it. And over time, your body cannot manage and store those large amounts of sugar. And so we develop more and more resistance to the sugar, which is how we develop type two diabetes. So a lifestyle over the years of eating large amounts of sugar can lead to type two? Sugar and carbohydrates, um, mm -hmm. high fat diet, you know, being overweight or obese um, can also um, lead to that, especially if those fat cells have, have developed, you know, so much inflammation that you now have um, that cascade throughout your body that leads to insulin resistance and all those negative effects that diabetes can have on the heart, the kidneys, the eyes, the blood vessels. I, I actually have a question. You brought up inflammation and Dr. Mom, and I keep reading about sugar causing inflammation throughout your whole body. Does it also cause inflammation around the heart? Um, so it, it does activate inflammatory cells that can uh, affect both the arteries as well as the heart cells. So yes, uh, you know, we now view diabetes as kind of a pro-inflammatory state that has a wide variety of effects uh, on the heart. So. Diabetes question coming in from Carson. Carson says he was told he has pre-diabetes and wants to know, does that mean I will automatically get type 2 diabetes? It doesn't. I mean, prediabetes is a precursor to diabetes, but this is also a really nice opportunity to aggressively modify lifestyle so that you can um, put that into remission and eventually regain some insulin sensitivity. Now, is the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, we got the similar question in a few different ways, um, is it just the time it develops? What's the biggest difference between type 1 and type 2? So type 1 diabetes is actually an autoimmune disease. Um, your pancreas does not make insulin, and so you need insulin to survive. Okay. Type 2 diabetes is where your body makes insulin, but it just becomes more and more resistant to it. So you need additional medications, and some people do eventually need extra insulin to help manage those blood sugars. I have a couple of questions uh, for, for Rob. Rob, the first one's from Alice. Alice wants to know, she writes, can you ask Rob if there are any foods he just flat out refuses to eat anymore. And what was the hardest change to make to your lifestyle? Yes, uh, what I try to do is uh, leave out white bread, white rice, and white pasta. Those three okay. things uh, are very high in carbohydrates and affected my sugar uh, quite a bit. And you uh, learn that from the dietitian and uh, nutritionist that I met with that uh, my doctor sent me to, but uh, it really works. And I also want to say that 
uh, diabetes is a journey. It's not a destination. Uh, it happens over a period of time where you develop these bad eating habits and adopt them. And uh, it's also a journey to get rid of them, uh, to take them out of your uh, daily routine. And the more you do, the better you get and the better you feel. So it's very positive to uh, watch what you eat, eat healthy foods, lean fat meats, uh, eat a lot of chicken, um, mm -hmm. and uh, just stay away from those white uh, flowers and uh, you'll do much better. Uh, Carol has a compliment for you. She says, please tell Rob he looks fantastic. What was his exercise regimen or what is it? Because it was a lifestyle change. Yes, I was uh, uh, in life, I uh, played sports uh, in my younger years and uh, softball and those kind of things. But as I aged, I still lift weights, but very light. I played golf uh, twice a week. And uh, when we go shopping, I try to, to walk if I have, uh, I also have lung issues. I have asthma and uh, COPD. And the COPD is uh, really not from smoking, it's from the scarring in my lungs from uh, all the chronic uh, bronchitis I've had through my life. But breathing is an issue, so it's hard to exercise, it makes it harder. But I still try to walk when I can and play golf twice a week. And I do, I do lift some weights, but it's lightweight. So nothing drastic. What I'm hearing is you simply started making choices to be a little more active and then cut out the white bread and the white rice and those starches, which seems yes. like something that would be very attainable for someone watching, wondering um, what they can do to protect their yeah. body. Caroline has a, a question. This is our final viewer question. Caroline wants to know if it's possible to cure yourself of type 2 diabetes through diet and lifestyle. So cure is... Um a tricky word because your diabetes can always come back if you don't maintain the lifestyle interventions. Okay. And so it's not a quick fix, it's not a diet. Cure implies that the condition is completely gone, but if you revert back to old habits, you can certainly redevelop that insulin resistance and have that A1C climb. But it's possible to totally get off the insulin and the medications through diet and lifestyle, is that possible? For some patients it is possible. For other patients they may need to continue on medications to help them achieve an A1C greater than or less than 6.5%. Um, it, it really does depend on how long you've had diabetes and how uncontrolled it's right. been, but some patients are able to manage their type 2 diabetes with aggressive lifestyle intervention alone. Rob, that must be wonderful to think about. You've already cut your insulin in half. Correct. I, uh, I want to make one comment. Uh, I went into the hospital with uh, uh, kidney stones, and uh, during that time, they identified that I had a heart issue, and uh, they ended up shocking my heart uh, because I was an AFib. Uh, wow. When I came to after that, uh, I felt great. I didn't know how bad I felt until they did that process to my heart. Um, they, my numbers are up now because I am eating better and exercising. In fact, uh, my numbers are in normal of the bottom uh, part of my heart pumping up to the top. Uh, but uh, you just don't know how bad you're feeling. And it comes on so slow because like I said, it's a journey you're getting worse a little at a time. So you have to get better a little at a time. And it's not quick. It's, uh, it takes a lot of work and a lot of thought into your, how you live your life. Well, you're putting in the work. You really are, and it shows. And that's so Thank great you. to see. I want to weave in our entire panel now for some final thoughts. I want to start with Dr. Gertie Novats. As you see Rob and, and get those audience questions, what would be your biggest message to our viewers? 
Um, Rob is absolutely right. This is a journey. It's a process. It's, it's not a quick fix, but it's absolutely manageable. And the most important thing is to really focus on a patient-centered approach and have a really strong team working with you. It's not just managing the high blood sugar. It's managing um, the high blood pressure, the cholesterol, many other factors. And so having that kind of multidisciplinary approach to work on several different things um, is going to help patients be successful. And as we go to Dr. Maman, that's that's what we're talking about here. We have an endocrinologist, you're a cardiologist. Rob's talking about the dietitian that he worked with. It must feel good to work in an environment where you're all on, on one team working for one patient, whoever that patient might be. Sure, sure. Uh, the, the parting words I would say is, um, prevention is always the best key here mm -hmm. and and it's never too late to change lifestyle eating better and exercising no matter how old or how young you are that is the key is to prevent damage to your heart and le leading a, a healthier mm -hmm. lifestyle Rob we are uh, getting questions and comments mainly people who want to see more of your artwork so I've got to ask you about your stained glass you are so talented how long have you been doing stained glass work I've been doing stained glass work off and on for about uh, 40 years. 40 and years? How'd you get into it? <gasps> Hold on. There's the... It's beautiful. Well, you're talking my language. You have wine and grapes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I've been doing it a long time. I took lessons. Uh, then I transferred all over the United States with my job and uh, various uh -huh. places that have glass that I could buy. Oh, I like but that one. when I do uh, have access to glass, I love doing it. Uh, it's, uh, you... It keeps you creative and uh, keeps you busy. And I just love doing it and I love the outcome. We were admiring your KU lampshade it was like a tiffany lampshade yeah. with ku uh is that going to be for sale do you sell any of your work because i know a lot of people who would want that i don't sell anything i uh i do it as a hobby i uh found that if you uh charge and start selling those things it becomes a job and i want to just be my hobby and, and be right. enjoyable to do it when i want to do it and as often as i want to do it uh and it's if you start terms. selling there's a demand it it just takes too much of your time right now that's I, I can get on board with that you know speaking of hobbies and things people do for joy and people enjoy doing outside of work we love bringing you this next segment it is called Behind. That's right, we're taking you behind the mask. We're gonna give you a look behind the mask at what our healthcare workers are like on a personal level. We do this every broadcast. Want to start with Dr. Gerdinovitz. Uh, you shared some awesome pictures of you and your now husband. And this is very recently now husband, Brian, right? Yeah. So let's take a look at your pictures because these are from your wedding. When did you get married? We got married in October. And where was it? Um, it was a little bit south um, here in Overland Park. And you went someplace very exotic for your honeymoon, not just not just within a drive of here. You went to Paris. We did. We we actually went to Switzerland, and then we went to Paris, and, oh. and we had a blast. It was great. How did you pick those two countries? Um, well, we love to ski, so mm -hmm. Switzerland um, had a little bit of skiing for us, and then um, we've always wanted to go to Paris and explore. We. Oh got to go to Champagne and go to one of our favorite Champagne houses. Oh, beautiful. Um, that was actually the same Champagne house that uh, Brian uh, used their Champagne when he proposed, so it was oh, really special. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's sweet. And you also shared with us that you are a first-generation American, so I want to know about your family and your parents. Yeah, my parents are, are Croatian, mm -hmm. so I was born and raised here in uh, Wyandotte County. I grew up in the Piper School District. Um, we still, My parents still live out there. Um, so I guess it was kind of the American dream. They had a little barbecue restaurant and, and myself and my brother and sister all worked there. Um, and so we still have, you know, the Croatian heritage is a big part of our life. I think right. that's a picture of my dad and my sister oh, at our, our church during one of the Croatian uh, soccer games for the World Cup. <laughs> and were you the, were your parents doctors? Are you the first doctor in the family? I'm the first. They must be really proud of you. Oh. I think they are. <laughs> we, we have got to show one more picture because, I mean, when you send us a cute picture of a puppy, 
we got it. We got it. Who's that? <laughs> That's my dog, Penny. Uh -huh. I've had her since she was uh, six and a half weeks old. So she is Cute. my baby, and she loves tennis balls. She still very much acts like a puppy, even though yes. she's five. I love that. Okay, now to Dr. Maman. You sent us so many wonderful pictures of your family. You are a family guy. We could not even pick which one was our favorite, so I'm going to play a slideshow we have, and I want you to tell us who these people are in these pictures, because you have dozens of family members. Let's take a look. Okay, these yep. three. This is my wife and my, my daughter, who's a freshman in college, and my son's a senior uh, in college. This is uh, my brother and his family. And, and what college do your kids go to? Uh, they go to Baylor. Uh, Baylor. Both of them go to Baylor in Texas. And yeah. are you? do you come from a family of doctors? Or are you, um, are you yeah, the first? Um, yes, uh, both physicians as well as PhDs. My father was an economist and a professor. So but not a lot of brain power at all in your family. <laughs> you work hard. You work hard. <laughs> you sure do. Yeah. Now, do your kids have any interest in following in your footsteps? Um, they're, they're in, uh, so my daughter's a biomedical engineer, so kind wow. of like medicine. And my son is uh, w working towards his PhD in economics. Whenever so. I hear about siblings going to the same college, I have to ask, did they bicker when they were younger? Oh, yes. <laughs> and then when, one, yeah. when the older one left, the other one missed? Miss them? Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, like any siblings, you bicker when you're younger yeah. and, and miss then them when they're older. gone. Yes, yes. And so now you only have to visit one place when you visit your kids in for college. Now. Yes, that's correct. I love that. Exactly. Well, thank you for sharing, and thank, thank you, you so much Thanks. for sharing. And Rob, uh, love seeing how successful you are and how you're really putting in the work, and it's working. You're getting healthier. You're tackling this. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, and thank really you all. Both doctors and uh, mm -hmm. enjoyed this session very much. Well, thank you for helping us educate ourselves and everyone watching on the diabetes journey and the, the heart connection. And thank you to our viewers for being with us today. We love when you join our conversation. Coming up next week on All Things Heart. It's like you're a walking time bomb. You know, you don't know when it's going to explode. It's pretty terrifying, you know. Wow, a nationally acclaimed artist living in fear after being diagnosed with an aortic aneurysm. How health system doctors and nurses, the whole team saved her from that ticking time bomb and the beauty she's creating right now because she can. Next Thursday morning at 10.